Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, and executioner lost in time, lost in space, and meaning. As far as geek subcultures go, Rocky Horror Picture Show is one that kind of mystifies me. I understand the appeal of the material. It's a campy, crazy B-movie with several fun songs and memorable characters. But as far as the whole getting dressed up for a midnight showing complete with full audience participation and onstage reenactment goes, well, I'm at a loss to explain why it inspires that level of devotion. I think a lot of people are, including the film's creators. It's just one of those lightning-in-a-bottle things that would be impossible to explain, let alone recreate. As if we needed proof of that statement, here's our next offender, Shock Treatment. The sequel to the beloved cult classic... <laughs> alright, alright, it's not a sequel! Okay, look. There is some connective tissue between Rocky Horror and Shock Treatment, but it's kind of confusing. We have some returning characters played by different actors, and some returning actors playing different characters. The two movies share a similar theme of innocence trapped in a bizarre world overseen by a sinister puppet master, but the events of the first film have no effect on those in the second, and there is little, if any, overarching narrative. Shock Treatment has been called a sequel, a spin-off, a follow-up, none of the above, and everything in between, and you could make arguments for all of those terms. I consider the phrase spiritual successor to be the most accurate, but that's just my personal opinion. Happy? Oh, you people are impossible. Let's examine the case of shock treatment. We start off, how else, with a little Rocky Horror-style narration. Once upon a time, in a town not far from yours, there lived a real fast guy. His life was fast. His friends were fast. <laughs> Even his food was fast. His sexual performance was fast. Oh, wait. The story takes place in Denton, a town contained entirely within the confines of a large television studio. Because the inhabitants have become so consumed by mass media that it literally encompasses their lives, but mostly because an ill-timed Screen Actors Guild strike limited the film's production budget. The movie opens with the chorus being ushered to their seats for another broadcast day, starting with sin number one, Denton, USA. Whereas Rocky Horror opened strong with its trademark red lips singing science fiction double feature, this piece doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Denton, USA is your basic, clean-cut American town on the outside, entirely phony on the inside satire, presented with an unbearably shrill chorus. the verses, which, well, listen for yourself. If you're looking for a life of leisure, you're gonna get a whole lot to please ya. Really. Leisure with please ya. Leisure, please ya. <laughs> bad Richard O'Brien, bad lyricist, no biscuit. This song would come off a lot better if the chorus was more cheerful in a very forced, scary way, but they look kind of bored with it. Okay, Cliff DeYoung is supposed to be the one not drinking the Kool-Aid, but what's their excuse? DeYoung has taken over the role of Brad Majors, who is now married to his love Janet, who is now played by Jessica Harper. They watch Denton's morning news show, which is hosted by Betty Hapshat, who you may remember was the girl who got married in the opening scene of Rocky Horror and then disappeared for the rest of the movie, and Judge Oliver Wright, played by the guy who was the narrator in the first film and who may or may not actually be the same character. Confused? You won't be. Yeah, and if you believe that, I have a summer home in the Ninth Circle you might be interested in. After the morning show, Brad and Janet are picked to be contestants on Marriage Maze, hosted by Bert Schnick, played by Dame Edna as Caesar Flickerman. The shadowy figure watching this development indicates that it is not by chance. I don't suppose there's any chance he'll turn out to be Ed Harris, is there? No, it's also Cliff DeYoung. Okay! The entire purpose of Marriage Maze is to browbeat Janet into getting Brad committed to the town insane asylum, Denton Vale. This is relatively easy, as it appears the Major's marriage has hit a bit of a difficult spot. Uh, yes, uh, he needs help. <laughs> help! Let's face it, Janet! Brad's an emotional creeper! Oh, like you would be doing any better after being seduced by a corset-wearing Tim Curry. 
Janet is convinced that chucking Brad into the loony bin will help their marriage, and they each voice their anxieties and concerns by singing to kitchen appliances. Look, it's a commentary on consumerism or something. Hello, Jessica, anybody home? Harper's performance, sin number two. It's not her singing. That's great. And it's not that she can't act, because she has some good moments later on when Janet becomes Denton's latest media sensation. But for some reason, she ends up delivering most of her major solos in the same way, staring directly at the camera with this kind of anxious look on her face. It keeps on going Since Janet is the person we end up following for the majority of the movie, it ends up killing her character arc. Brad gets shipped off to Denton Vale, which is run by the brother-sister team of Cosmo and Nation McKinley, played by Richard O'Brien and Patricia Quinn. No points for guessing these two are weird, sinister in the employ of the villain, and more than a little incestuous. Seriously, O'Brien, Game of Thrones isn't this obsessed with siblings getting it on. Also in the Denton Vale staff are Little Nell, who provides panty shots, and Rick Mayall, who is there to be a strange Rick Mayall type. So while Evil Cliff watches in his control room as Good Cliff is drugged and straightjacketed, Janet goes off to be consoled by her parents, who never really liked Brad anyway. Oh, poor Brad. Thank God he was born an orphan. Would have killed his parents. <laughs> there you go, the movie's one good line. You're welcome. But Janet's parents mostly function as an example of sin number three, the film's unfocused satire. It's trying to comment on certain cultural trends, but it's not so much commentary as it is a list of broad themes. TV rots your brain, manufactured celebrities make bad role models, pop psychology is a load of hooey, and middle-class suburbia is a hotbed of backwards neoconservatism. These aren't bad messages for a movie to have, but they're not explored very well. Janet's dad gets a song called Thank God I'm a Man, which is three minutes of poking fun at patriarchal attitudes and the Hallelujah Chorus. Okay, so Janet's dad embodies a mentality that is outdated and sexist. And... This scene doesn't say anything that hasn't been said better by other people, and it ties in only loosely to the film's overall theme of media saturation and influence. I suppose O'Brien and Jim Sharman get some credit for trying to put a little social commentary into what is an absurd low-budget musical, but I would almost rather the effort hadn't been made at all rather than having it carried out in this perfunctory manner. Anyway, back to the actual plot. Evil Cliff is fast food mogul and Denton TV mastermind Farley Flavors, who is seeking the McKinley's support for his new mass market therapy show, Faith Factory. He also wants Janet as the girl next door spokesmodel for his new project, and tell me his video pitch doesn't scream ulterior motive. I'm going to package and sell some mental health to the nation with my dream of the girl next door. Here's the problem. The villains aren't charming enough to pull this off. This is Demonic Theory 101. You have to make the bad choice appealing so that people will want it even if they know it's wrong. I can't imagine Janet being taken in by these characters unless she's horrendously stupid. Which, I don't know, she might be. Evil Cliff shows flashes of charisma, but he spends most of his time in the control room, so most of the temptation is passed off on the henchmen and they just come off as too skeevy to be seductive. Although, to be fair, filling those high-heeled shoes is a task that would daunt almost anyone. Oh, and the video chat? File that away for a later facepalm. Janet is initially reluctant, but is told being famous will help cure Brad, and... Look, the plot of Rocky Horror didn't make any infernal sense, so what do you expect from this movie? Suffice it to say, she gets on board with the evil scheme and is granted a glamorous makeover, set to a rather familiar-sounding tune. Well, first you go rip, rip, rip. Then you go snip, snip, snip. Then you whip it and zip, zip, zip. I spit it up to the hip, hip, hip. After getting all.
all robert palmer girled up janet is an instant hit with the audience which just as instantly goes to her head meanwhile betty and oliver have been fired from the news desk and spend a lot of time snooping around and implying that something suspicious is going on which we knew already but something else is going on sin number five this movie is focusing on the wrong people Janet's story is the main part of the plot, but I was more curious about what was happening to Brad in the loony bin. It's obvious that his treatment is actually what's driving him mad, but what exactly are they doing to him? That kind of thing can be disturbing, thought-provoking, even funny if you play it right. Instead, he's mostly ignored until about the last half hour of the film. We also spend a lot of time with Betty and Oliver, which is a mistake because their characters aren't very interesting. It's like if the original Rocky Horror had spent most of the movie in the narrator's office. Meanwhile, Farley sits on the sidelines too much to be an effective antagonist, Rick Mayall is so underused you're likely to forget he's in the movie altogether, and there's a garage band called Oscar Drill and the Bits who show up in the third act and help the good guys for no discernible reason. I'm not expecting a great story in all this, but you could easily construct a better one using the same characters without too much effort. Janet turns into a ruthless prima donna with surprising speed, which, I don't know, might be the joke, since she just as quickly decides stardom isn't satisfying her and has a freaky dream sequence, which is just an excuse to film a freaky dream sequence. I'm looking for love. I'm looking for trade. But despite her misgivings, the debut of Faith Factory is close at hand, as indicated by sin number six, Look What I Did to My Id. It's kind of a catchy tune, but the lyrics don't really mean anything, which, given that the movie is supposed to be a satire of trendy psychobabble, is kind of self-defeating. So, you caused your ingrained instinctive impulses to dress up like a doctor? I don't get it. Backstage, Betty does some digging in one of those plot-specific databases and discovers that Cosmo and Nation McKinley are con artists who've been operating under the names of various past presidents. A bit of free advice, you two. If you want to cover your nefarious deeds, you shouldn't choose a theme for your aliases. You also might want to pick first names that are less distinctive than Cosmo and Nation. She also learns that Brad and Farley are twins who were separated when they were orphaned and adopted by separate parents. Brad's were rich, Farley's were poor. Farley resents his long-lost brother as a result, and so... He made himself into a huge fast-food tycoon, went into broadcasting, gained control of the entire town, and is now looking to steal away Brad's wife in revenge? That may be the most convoluted plan that doesn't involve a villain who gets caught by Scooby-Doo. While Oscar Drill and the Bits warm up the crowd, Betty and Oliver break Brad out of Bedlam while Farley and his cronies drink and gloat as villains are wont to do. And how does vocal girl Janet Majors fit into the scheme of things? <laughs> oh, hi, Janet. We were just discussing our evil schemes for which you are but a pawn. Champagne? Brad? Okay, do you remember that scene where Janet got the pitch from the bad guys? You know, that scene that involved a video from Farley Flavors which allowed Janet to get a nice long look at his face, and yet she never realized that, hey, this guy is an exact duplicate of her husband, and now she's reacting in shock like she's just seen Brad's evil twin for the first time when she clearly hasn't? Yeah. Ready? Set! Faith Factory premieres with Janet being introduced as Miss Mental Health and getting showered with gifts, and I think she's supposed to look all hollow and empty inside, but really it's not much different from the way Jessica Harper has looked for half the movie. Eventually, Farley comes out and does an obvious Citizen Kane illusion, which sounds like a good time for his wronged brother to come bursting in. Seducer! And who are you, sir? Your twin brother and your accuser! Brad! Jessica, darling, you have got to stop getting yourself involved with these media moguls. You always wind up getting caught in the middle of this big, messy confrontation on live television. The Long Lost Twins face off, which somehow leads to sin number eight, Dual Duet, another long, tricked-out fantasy sequence where DeYoung's two characters basically say you suck back and forth for a couple minutes. You're a failure. A malformation in the guise of Manny and also Rand. I 
like the idea of having the two parts of a dual role come into conflict through song, and it can be done well, like a confrontation in Jekyll and Hyde. Not the revival version, though. What was up with that? Unfortunately, we haven't seen enough of either of these characters to be invested in them in any way. And one of them didn't even know the other existed until ten minutes ago, so there's nothing for them to play with. I'm also a little perplexed by what exactly is supposed to be going on here. Is this all going on in Farley's head? Brad's? Both? Are they reflecting mutual insecurities, or is this just an excuse to get all surreal with the direction again? Your guess is as good as mine. Farley is all set to have Brad shipped back to Denton Vale, but Janet Chekhov's guns her way out of the situation by revealing she never actually signed the commitment papers when Brad was put away. Defeated by this convenient turn, Farley just up and says, well, screw it, has the four heroes kicked out of Denton, and names Betty's ex-husband's trophy girlfriend as the new Miss Mental Health in Janet's place. Yeah, I didn't mention her before because she's even less interesting than the rest of the supporting cast. The good guys are locked up in an office, but thanks to your average, cripplingly stupid guard, they're able to get out, and with the help of a car hotwired by Oscar Drill and the Bits, they escape the confines of Denton which, if we actually cared about any of these characters, might count as a happy ending. And the rest of the cast? Well, they all happily commit themselves to Denton Vale. After having to sit through this movie, I don't blame them. It's been said that camp must be found, not made, and shock treatment definitely supports that theory. It contains many of the same elements as its predecessor, but they don't click together in the right way. While there are some attempts at cultural commentary, they're never developed enough to actually say anything. It also suffers from an unmemorable villain and a bland supporting cast. Several stretches are just boring, which is the one reaction I shouldn't have to a movie that wants to follow in the footsteps of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For her inability to act and sing at the same time, we condemn Jessica Harper to walk up Mount Everest while chewing gum, patting her head, and rubbing her tummy. For failing to provide any menace, seductive charisma, or anything that might make him an effective antagonist, we condemn Farley Flavors to serve as the bad guy in a Power Rangers series. Finally, for a poor attempt to emulate something that can't and probably shouldn't be emulated, we condemn Richard O'Brien to the one effort worse than his own, the Rocky Horror Glee Show. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>